Sunday. Uh, we are back again here with this particular perspective, uh, uh, saying that why we are trying to talk about uh, uh, data literacy today is very, very important. Today, let me quickly introduce, I have uh, three uh, panelists. Mr. Ashutosh Agarwal from Sanskriti School is not able to kind of join today because of his health issues. And uh, we are looking forward that in one of my next episodes, surely I'm going to uh, uh, get him also to be part of this particular conversation. And But let's try to quickly get into the guest. So I have Mrs. Bhupinder Gogia, principal of Satpal Mithil School, Ludhiana, uh, which is ICSC school and uh, caters to uh, multiple uh, profile of people. And uh, this is a school which has completed almost like 15 years plus. I have Mr. Amitav Ghosh. She represents the northern part of uh, country. Uh, next, we have central part of uh, country, Mr. Amitav Ghosh. Again, a principal, a good friend for last 15 years, who's leading, was the founder principal of Bhavats, one of the most sought after institution in uh, uh, central India. And uh, he's going to share some of his experience. On the western part of the country, I have uh, Wilbro George, Willie, that's how I'm going to call him across. Somebody again, who has been playing with data and catering to a different profile of people, 80 kilometers plus away from a city of Mumbai, uh, in a place called as Nala Sopara, and uh, he is a mentor with uh, Billboard School Nala Sopara. So that's a uh, belief for us. With just a basic introduction, let's get into the session with uh, two, three things which I wanted to kind of uh, touch upon in this particular session. Last couple of months, I have been trying to work with uh, you know multiple uh, organizations trying to understand what is going to happen and how exactly these things are going to impact all of us at schools, particularly teachers. And when we try to talk about uh, the kind of uh, changes which are happening and the decision making which is going to happen in schools or in, in and around us, I think we have to see a lot of things needs to come in. But one of the challenges, one of the things which came out explicitly is uh, is that if you are not going to have data, if you are not going to have data, you will not be able to take a decision, a decision which is uh, uh, scientific in nature, which is much more uh, systematic in nature. And if it is not happening, then I think you will not be able to kind of uh, make decisions. Uh, people are uh, talking about, uh, uh, you know, data when it comes to talk about student portfolio, particularly as such. Thanks to new education policy with so much... Uh, uh, personalization of education, which is going to be talked, which has been talked in that. And then when you try to talk about a 360 day report card, you are trying to talk about a peer assessment, you're talking about a teacher assessment, you're talking, multiple things are happening across the country right now when we are talking on this particular topic here. So what we thought is that I think we will try to take uh, at least some three, four episodes exclusively, first trying to understand where we are in terms of data literacy in the country. And intentionally, that's why in this particular episode, I have not moved into metros. So many people said, why nobody is there for metros? We said, no, we would like to first go and try to understand what happens in the tier two and tier three cities, and then try to come back to metro and then see that how exactly, uh, what are some of the practices happening? The second question, which was asked to me very, very specific is that, are we trying to talk about data analytics? Yes, we will talk about analytics, but if you don't know what we need, and what we are collecting, I think analytics will not want to work with us. So what we are thinking is that the next three, four episodes, based on the response and based on the you know questions which are going to come in, we will take a decision and then we will try to show you some live examples, how people have used different, different, um, uh, you know, homegrown methods, uh, used technology tools to make sure that how these data is collected, worked upon and uh, looked upon. One of the very, 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 very important uh, point uh, when I was kind of uh, uh, looking uh, that I should do a session on this, uh, one of the very interesting quotes from Honorable uh, UK Prime Minister in his first speech, uh, Rishi Sonak, he made a very, very interesting uh, comment and uh, he spoke very clearly in that in a world where data is everywhere and statistics underpin every job, our children's job will require more analytic skills than ever before. And letting our children out into the world without those skills is letting our children down. So I think it's a very, very hard, fine and hard hitting comment, which came out from the Honorable UK Prime Minister in his first speech 
and which he talked about it. The third point which came up to me was, uh, are we talking about data literacy for students? We will come to that little later. If uh, in a school, if the teacher himself is herself is not going to have this kind of a literacy, I think we are not going any, anywhere. But just for the discussion, just to make sure that I'm going to repeat this definition again and again, uh, what we meant was data literacy is nothing but a set of skills that teachers will need to ask questions, collect the data, collect or based the answers on it, analyze, interpret, and communicate with real kind of uh, you know language data or actionable data, actionable uh, statements, which is going to be very very important for people to kind of look for. With that particular note, let me uh, ask the you know first question. You know. And I'm going to run uh, uh, in all the three directions. So we'll start from the northern part of country. Mrs. Gogia, we would like to ask you this particular question. What are the different types of data typically? What are the different types of data that is typically getting collected? Getting collected in your school, in all spheres. We are not only talking about academics. We are not talking about administration. We are not talking about academic administration. But I would like to start from you. Just a few examples where all you are collecting data and what are the different types of data that you're collecting. And then we will go to Willie and then we'll come to Amrita. Yeah. yeah. We have uh, first kind of data that we are collecting is demographic data. That is your student data, your teacher data, your parental profile, student profile, and um, uh, other details like where they come from, which are the, you know, what are the occupations? What do they do? So all that demographic data is collected from this play from one point. The other point that we collect is where which every school does, that is your academic and co-curricular, that is your achievement-based data, wherein you're getting data on uh, the academic scores, the economic performance, the performance in co-curricular activities in sports, etc. Then the third kind of data which we have is the process data, wherein we are talking of the various processes that we are doing and how we are going about a particular thing. For example, if I'm having infirmary data, which is getting saved, for what, what is the format of it? What kind of data is getting stored? And how are you moving along with that? When you, talked about is, that, my moment, when you talked about that infirmary data, what is the kind of data that gets collected in infirmary? Uh, well, in infirmary, like every month, the school doctor has to give me a uh, report, which is a graphical report on the number of uh, students who had come to the infirmary and for what reasons. Fine, that's okay. So now you can continue. I just wanted, you know, yeah. infirmary is something which not many No, and this, this kind of data is also collected for teachers and the support staff, okay. both. And uh, the fourth kind of data is, of course, uh, the survey data and the perception data, which we take, like recently, my students gave a feedback on the teachers. Now my teachers will be giving a feedback on the leadership team. So a kind of, you know, date gathering from them, what is their opinion about what this entire year went by? Fine. So thank you. Uh, Willie, what's, what about you? And then I'll come to Amita. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, so we, we are always very uh, question based. So we are always thinking about what is it that we want to change? What is the next new project that we want to do? And once we have that in place, then we start collecting data because then we, we actually know what's the kind of data that we really need to collect before we start working on, uh, on, um, uh, you know, on it. So one of the things that, um, uh, one of the projects that we are working on right now is to build a new curriculum. So uh, since we want to build a new curriculum, we're taking as much data as possible in terms of uh, what are the resources they have at home? How much time do they have? Do they have people at home who are going to be working uh, with them? Uh, what is their level of uh, tech skills and, you know, that kind of background we're taking along with, uh, we're looking at a lot of information around teachers. What is it that, where are the skill gaps? What are the uh, improvement areas that they need to do? So all our data systems are based on a very, very specific process. Uh, this is admissions time. So we are always looking at making sure that parents who want to know more about our school get all the information really fast so that they can consider our school. So we've figured out lots of different methods uh, of collecting data to make sure where are these parents, what are they like, uh, uh, you know, uh, people like this do things like that. And so we try to do these associative uh, 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 methods of finding the right kind of people, because it's not about getting those 200 odd people joining our school. It's about finding 
uh, there are right 200 people who, who align with the vision and mission of our school. Uh, and that cannot happen just by putting a holding saying that, you know, admissions open. So we're, we're going out there and looking at the interests that people have, collecting the data, and then literally changing our behavior uh, with them. So it could, it could mean uh, changing office times. It could mean changing methods of communication. I'll give you a very quick example. Uh, most of our parents, uh, you know, said, uh, "Up WhatsApp, pick. you know, we like WhatsApp. We don't need, we don't want to do Google Classroom. We don't want to do that. We like WhatsApp. So we spent two weeks building bots on WhatsApp. And so now we have a full service WhatsApp parents customer support system, right? So the point I'm trying to make is we like to take data. We like to collect data and quickly do something with it and change some of our processes as opposed to just collect data and then figure out Maybe something might happen in the future. So just to just to just to kind of you talked one thing about is the data with related to the parent and parent profile because admission season is out there, and then you were trying to see that what kind of profile of people are kind of coming in. What are the other areas like other than admission that you are trying to look for? Very very specific. We'll get into the how you are utilizing it. We'll get into the little later into that. So what are the other areas that specifically that you are getting? So we've got all the academic data. We, we're getting emotional check-ins in terms of, are you happy today? What are you happy with? You know, what could make you happier? We are, uh, we, we do, we're not only doing a lot of quantitative data, right? We're also doing a lot of qualitative data. So we're walking around the school, meeting people, talking to people, checking in, checking with them, finding out how are they happy? You know, what's the general school climate like? Because um, not all data has to be quantitative. Once we take that qualitative rich data, then we can then make it quantitative, right? So there is a there's a lot going on. You know, we, we enter the school like with a with a with a highly super sensitive radar, and we're looking for all the things, including uh, uh, if I ask a question to if I'm taking a meeting with 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 15 teachers, if I ask a question, what's the speed at which the hand comes up? Or, you know, who raises it first and why do they do that? Or I enter into a room and I might even say, hey, why don't you go sit wherever you want to sit? It's free seating. And then we start looking at where are people people sitting and why are they sitting where they're sitting? So the point I'm trying to make is uh, for us, data is not just purely a numeric value. It might eventually become a numeric value. But initially, you know, data is just this. Every time a teacher or a parent have said, Hame ye nahi karna hai school mein, because humko hai ki parents ki nahi, parents accept nahi That is a conclusion or inference that you have taken based on some data points that you have. Very good. So I think that gives a lot of clarity to us saying that we also need to understand our stakeholder profile very, very clear, as Mrs. Boge also said. And I think it makes a lot of sense for us to uh, work around it and then say that, okay, this is how we are going to go back and work. So let's hear from Amita. Amita, you have been somebody who has been uh, worked in different profiles of schools, residential schools. Uh, then you have worked, uh, you have set up a school. So when you, you, you have seen the different types of data, you yourself have been monitoring. And I'm sure uh, right from number of applications to uh, what you, what challenge you have today, you know, with regard to the students and teachers and parents, I think you may be using a lot of data. So why don't you share some of your experiences in terms of data? Uh, well, really the process of uh, data collection at school, in, in, in my school, begins at the point where people start walking, walking in to inquire for admissions. Like as a school, typically when it's been 14 years, so I don't uh, have the need to put up any hoardings or anything. So people know admissions begin post Diwali. So they start inquiring right after the Shara, and that's how the process picks up. So that is where the data collection starts. So basically, uh, when parents register, that's the first point of data collection. Once they come back after registration, the second point of data collection, where a little more detailed data is collected. But most of the data that is collected up to the point of admission is mostly students' data and parents' data. And this also may include certain data like who is your, you know, who is your family doctor, whom should we contact in case of an emergency. So we also have, in addition to parents' data and students' data, we also have a lot of data on the available pediatricians in the city, who is at what distance. So this is one form of data, I think student profiling and parent profiling, first form of data that gets collected. Subsequently, as the child in the school and as, as we get to, as the child starts, you know, uh, interacting in school and as the child goes through the process of school, I think in the entire 
life cycle of the child at school. Typically, a child spends on an average about 12 to 14 years in school. During that time, I think enormous amount of data gets collected because the moment a child enters school, a file gets built up of the child. I think all of us must be doing that process. So you, you, you're, you're there is a, the, when you're saying file, it, it basically means the child portfolio per se. The child portfolio. Then yeah. that file right from class junior KG starts getting built up. And with every succeeding year, a lot of data gets added to the file in terms of the child's performance, in terms of the remarks that the parents give in the PTM register, in terms of any communication that goes to the child. So that is the second level of data that is collect that, that gets built up over the years. Now, in addition to this, then there is this academic data that also comes as the child keeps going in school. Uh, in addition to this, there is also a third range of data like that keeps getting built over a period of time, and that is the administrative data. So data on what is the inventory in school, how much of things have been used in school. So like monthly consumption. So suppose there are washrooms and you require, you know, you 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 need to know what is the amount of uh, things that you are using in the washroom. How is the maintenance of washroom done? Then those data also gets generated over a period of time, which eventually after one year. So when we take a stock and when we look at the budget, I think that's where we also start using the data. So typically in a school. In addition to the parents, the child's profile, the parents' profile, the profile of doctors, the profile of, you know, the, the academic profiles that get built and the administrative data. In addition to this, you also have, ma'am said that the uh, infirmary, we, we call it the wellness room. So a lot of data also keeps, keeps getting generated in the wellness room, which is in addition to the inputs that the parent gives at the We are losing you, Amita. Okay, while the, while the time Amita is trying to get back to us, uh, let me also kind of uh, take up the second part because what came out from all the three uh, speakers is very, very specific. Amita, we lost you. Would you like to continue now? Yeah. No, no, I said, uh, so uh, students' data, parents' data, the profile of the child as he admits, as he gets admitted in school over the past 12 years, enormous amount of data in terms of academics, the administrative data in terms of everything, maintenance of the school building, the material required, all these data, these are basically the types of data get, that get generated in school. And this also includes a lot of health specific data, a lot of physical uh, no, data on the physical and intellectual abilities of the child. Sure. I think these are the different types of data that uh, we have been building in school. Sure. So thank you, all three of you. I think it came out very, very clearly that uh, first and the foremost thing when I, what I'm trying to understand is the segmentation of data needs to be purely based on the stakeholder profile that we are trying to cater to, whether it is a student, parent, teaching, non-teaching staff. And then further, we can kind of get into academics. Uh, then you can look at, you know, wellness, like what uh, we heard. And then we can also start looking at it, how it can be, you know, helpful in our own initiatives uh, per se as such. But I think one, cha one particular thing I would like uh, all three of you to ask, building on the first question itself is, uh, do you think the age of the school matter in the what kind of data that do we collect? Any, any one of you can start. Age of the data, age of the school, first five years, first seven years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Do you think the uh, the data collection, uh, data, what, whatever get whatever we're gathering, does it change over a period of time? Yes, it yes, does get changed. Like in the initial years of the school, uh, if I look at the parental profile, I would have parents from the business families, mostly, uh, almost 95% coming from the business family. But as the school started, you know, establishing itself with an academic reputation, doing well in all spheres, you see that there's a working segment which is coming into it. You have bureaucrats who are joining the school. You have parents where both are working, which are coming into the school. So the entire profile of the parents has changed. And similarly, what we were doing around 15 years ago and what we are doing now are changed. 
because based on the parental profile, you will have to change many of your practices Correct. to make sure that now you're meeting the, the your needs of the present time. Sure. Uh, Billy? Well, I think um, data has an expiry date. Uh, okay. That's, that's the way I look at it. Um, a lot of the data that we collect, uh, as, I, as, as I said earlier, is very focused because we want to make some change. Uh, we try to be, we try to lead with data. We try to lead with change. Um, by by by, what I mean by that is, we are very intentionally setting where the school wants to go in terms of its academic pedagogy, in terms of its uh, academic vision, instructional pedagogy, in terms of the social aspects of the school. So we try our level best to set the course, right? And when we are setting the course, um, we're using data in short bursts of time, right? Short okay. bursts of time. We don't collect data and then wait years and years and years because data just changes. And most of the time, when we look at the way data is also collected, um, that will not give us very accurate sort of data. And the data we collect, again, is temporary data. Uh, we, you know, we're not talking about the other kind of data that may not change like your family constitution your you know your your, your demographics a lot of that choices, not... choices may change you know choices may stay change that's that's exactly. very yeah that's what i'm saying yeah. so i love that particular statement of uh, you know expiry date of data what you yeah. said can you can, can you just uh, help me just one example particularly if my school is in 0 to 7 years what kind of data I should focus on, and then I will, you know, I, I I can say that now I I need not look at this particular. Data. So when you said expiry data, I'm I'm just saying it's very difficult to to say that. Uh, I don't think there's anything like a seven year old school or a ten year old school. We have been running a school for twenty years, and I tell my teachers we are still a startup because we are still trying to figure out what we are. The fact that we are, you know, the fact that we may get into uh, this state of rigor mortis saying that, okay, we are now five years, we are now eight years. It means we've set things in place. Things are now cast in stone. We don't need to actually change. We don't need to maneuver. We don't need to maneuver. Not that. You know? So if we get into a state of rigor mortis, we, 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 you know, we obviously have a problem. The fact that um, uh, two things that the other speaker spoke about, that we are here to serve the needs of the people who have enrolled in our institution. That itself tells us that we need to start collecting a lot of data every day. Anything that moves, we need to figure out. So I'm not really sure at this time that I would I would be able to tell you that, uh, you know, if it is seven years, then this particular kind of data has got expired. But I can tell you one thing for sure. Keeping track of your competitive environment, right? Uh, that is something that that, that, that data keeps changing, right? So example, another speaker said, Madam said that we had a lot of business people who were who are coming to our school and now they're not coming to our school. So the big question I'm going to ask myself is, where are they going, right? So that is, you know, external factors change the parameters, the frequency and the quality of data that you need to collect. Sure. Actually, Willie, we had uh, initially 95% business profile now we have come to 75% business profile and 25% is from the working segment. So you see the change in the demographic of the parents. And the big question to ask would be why, right? I mean, data allows us, data, from my experience, data doesn't give us any answers. Data allows us to ask questions, Correct. you know? And that's what I would find. Good, thank you. Thank you, Amit uh, Bhattikal. Amita, what is your take on it? Because uh, you you also have been kind of working on it, right? You have been trying to say that, okay, this is how things will work. This is uh, what has worked. Because initially as a founder principal, one of the very important data is that uh, first year, how many uh, seats I have and how many seats and vacant seats I have. You know? So what is your take? How did you kind of move into changing this particular perspective? Now I know that your school may be in good demand and people may be, you know, coming and waiting in queue to get data. But in the initial years, what was your focus thing and how did it come? Uh, I think the initial, basically, when I have had the experience of going from a school that had a full fledged 940 kids to a school that was yet to be. So moving from 940 to zero was the first shock I got. 
because i realized that in society a principal's image is defined by numbers ye aapke paas kitne bachche hai i mean that's how it goes basically so when somebody says so i don't know when i started the school see the initial years of any school is always focused on numbers because and it has been my learning that in the initial year in the first year every school starts with some thoughts some philosophy now it is also very important that you deliver what you say rather if i put it you know in the other perspective it is important to under promise and under deliver rather than over promise and under deliver so in the first year you know a lot of people watch you and they are sitting on the fence now okay. when you finish that one year and you deliver what you promised those people will sort of jump into the school so i have had a situation where i went where i started where when i joined the building was yet to be done so we did a building and started you know with 167 kids in the first year second year it jumped to 502 third year it jumped to 1012 fourth year it jumped to you know 1518 and you know in five years i had 2000 kids so it i feel over a period of time you know initial years are always about numbers but once you know once you have you once you cultivate that faith it is no longer about numbers then the data that data of numbers needs to be used for something else okay. like That's i wanting to kind of uh, come yeah. into like what expiry yeah. so uh, so, so my my uh, thought is that over a period of time this data evolves and as i said it is not in, it is more important to know what you will do with the data rather than having data so it's it's, it's so, just so, like so you know my, the second question will kind of build upon that itself uh, what are you doing with so much of data which is coming in because one of the challenges when uh, when i go and talk to teachers across country and management they said so much workload you guys are trying to give it to us you know why are you trying to collect this data which is of no relevance to us so what are you doing with this particular data and how are you trying to say that this is important for us so see uh, as uh, ma'am had already mentioned initial years when i had a lot of you know, 90% business community and 10% working profession working people over a period as i finish you know 14 years now it's become sort of 60 60% business and 40% working professionals so i know that so one way is you use the data first thing that we did in our school is we use the data and try to understand okay if you you know the data gives you a peep into the psyche of parents that's the first way at least i think i use the data secondly when you have that much data and you know when you start you can also make out certain trends you can make out certain trends in the data like okay this data is like when you look at the data of children who are availing the school transportation you can feel that the concentration of children in a particular area is high hmm. so okay then you go to go back to that data and see okay in that concentration is the service class high or is the business community high but so then the, the, you know that, accordingly that also depend upon accord, accordingly i think you said your a... uh, yeah am i audible now yeah yes i think uh, dr santel probably really yeah, yeah. sir am i audible yeah now you are clear i think you uh, there was a little challenge with your internet okay okay so, yeah, so that is uh, one <laughs> way of one way you use data is where the concentration is high then you have uh, your transportation planned in that manner another thing is when you look at the class wise data on child performance you can also make out certain trends which where are the which are the kids i mean who are performing better in in very simple terms i mean you can always have that you know feel that okay this is a particular when you look at the background of the kids and you see you can always know that okay this this uh, kids are doing better so then how do we work on those kids and how do we work on the kids how do we give them enrichment and how do we give the other set of kids some remedial so maybe you know in in different ways you know it is also important like in administrative data you you, you also need to figure out uh, when the load of the kids on the washrooms is the highest 
so at a point of time there are 2000 kids in school so when do washrooms need to be cleaned so that you know uh, there is that uh, specific uh, hygiene maintained in school okay. so you need to clean the washrooms when all the 2000 kids are there in school at one point of time maybe morning the frequency of cleaning could be less after evening it could be less but maybe somewhere around the midday the frequency of cleaning should be very high so okay. when different ways of looking at data that's that's my take sure really um i think the, the, was the question uh, what do you how are you how data? are you using uh, what are you doing with this particular data you are collecting so much data you said that you are already yeah. i mean i mean I, i hope you take my answer in the spirit in which i'm saying it a lot of my time a lot of my time a lot of my cognitive energy um a lot of my bike rides a lot of my walks in the evening a lot of my candlelight dinners with my wife also is is spent thinking about how much of that data i need to ignore um because you know so much of the data that we are collecting um uh you know might might tell us the wrong things it might tell us uh things that might take us away from things let me give you two examples first is a proverb which said that uh, the genius of a man or a woman is knowing you know how much and when to ignore right Correct. so <laughs> that's important because, because data might change over time and if i saw it today and then i took a decision it could be knee jerk for me right that's the first thing the second thing is this whole big million effect right you when we start taking data and we start seeing that some kids are doing well and some kids are not doing well and then if we take the decision of publishing that data among children among teachers then we may start putting the sense of you know uh, inequitable industrial age educational system where parents uh, teachers may even feel that things may get institute the wrong things may get institutionalized uh, people from this pin code people from that bus route may tend to not do well versus people from this you know so i'm very scared about what is it that i publish what is it that i talk or what affects me because then that might get me away from my vision of building an equitable uh you know educational system that 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 ensures that every child gets the best right so Correct. setting belief and high expectations regardless of your identity and where you are who you are or what your last name is, is 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 so essential so that's why i keep saying that while a lot of this data really helps us take administrative calls it helps us build efficiency inside a school system um, our goal as 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 loving compassionate educators is to be able to build effectiveness of learning and making sure that our children are receiving the best from us every single day so yeah, yeah. i spend a lot of time thinking what i should ignore <laughs> <laughs> so the art of ignoring is something which teachers really need to kind of build upon over a period of time yes mrs gogia please go ahead what's you uh, how are you what are you doing with so much of data you already shared some yeah. examples um to, to first start with the infirmary example itself see the data which we collect from the infirmary uh, it it is presented in two graphs one for the staff and one for the children now when uh, re- every month i get to see the major areas in which children have been visiting infirmary for example if in one year i saw that the number of <laughs> abrasions and cuts were the highest in that entire statistical data so then what did we do we try to keep a, we try to look into what are the areas into which, due to which you had your cuts and abrasions then you realize that in the basketball field the children were getting maximum cuts and abrasions so then what you did was in the summer holidays we got the entire basketball court renovated so you you're taking an action based on the data that is coming similarly i think last month we had data wherein we had maximum number of children having stomach ache so then we said okay maybe they are eating stuff which they should not be eating or eating in a wrong way so we called a doctor who conduct, who conducted a workshop for the students and the parents that what is the right eating habits what kind of food that the children should be eating and how can you ensure that the child has a mix of both only nutritious data and also a part of it being the other data other food that they eat so uh, that's one kind of data so you spoke about teachers being uh, overburdened by data <laughs> this is one well i get that i get to hear that very often 
So um, I think uh, all thanks to you, the entire school is working on the annual academic planner. So teachers have mapped the syllabus, the LO learning outcomes and the assessments and the pedagogies, et cetera. So why did we, what are we doing with that data? We realize like when we talk of data liter literacy skills, you realize that perhaps you have not done graphical representation of data in, it's not going, data interpretation is not going across grades. So somewhere perhaps in one class, that particular chapter itself is missing or it's not getting integrated in any, any particular subject. So then you, you complete the gaps, you fill the gaps as you're going. So as the teachers are doing, now they're realizing that Yes, it is giving us these, you know, we're getting to know why children were not performing in a particular area or why is it that class five children have a problem in class six where Punjabi is concerned or English is concerned or any other subject or similarly in the senior school. So that's how we utilize data. Sure. Um, Amita, the next question is that uh, what, what do you think or how your teachers are responding to this particular point of collection of data it, it is such a pain point and i think i'm i'm here only if, uh, you know talking about their concerns because this is one challenge which we keep hearing so amita what is your teachers are trying to say and how do you manage this particular point i think as far as the collection of data is concerned uh, hmm. i haven't felt any pain point from my teachers as yet uh, we have been collecting the data but as I said before, I mean, uh, it is more important to know what you'll do with the data because many times, you know, you have to give that background that we need this data for this. Then the, I think then it is not a problem. But if you just ask to collect data, many times it becomes that the effort is too tight. Yes. So, I mean, in, in I, I have never felt the issue with collecting data and uh, because once the data is collected and consolidated and put in the format that we desire, and that format is, that format depends on the purpose for which you're collecting the data. I think, I mean, I hardly have an issue with that. Yeah. No, really, no, no, teachers you? don't tell you uh, on your face. Uh, when, <laughs> and in fact, when you have to do any process, like, unless you take teachers on board and you explain to them why you're doing a particular process, you will never be able to get the information that you're trying to get. So you're taking your teachers on board, you agree, you know, that yes, we will be doing this thing because we need to do this for these particular reasons. But then, you know, being a teacher, even I'm a teacher, so I know this, that the moment I'm given more work, I tend to crib that what kind of so much of work has come in. Why the hell did I do I need to map the pedagogies or why do I need to map the assessments? That's a very natural trend. But when they start doing it, they realize that they're finding value, then they, they are okay with it. So the month of uh, January, I think when we started, there was a lot of cribbing. By now, everybody is understanding why the data is being collected and what are we doing with the data. So it's it's the maturity level of the teachers which takes time. Yeah, believe. That's what I said. You you need to go back and you need to give a background as yeah, to why you, you can't just trust anything. You you need to give a background. Okay, Correct. this is the reason. Correct. I agree. This is what I we agree. are going to use the data for. I mean, then you will not have any resistance. I mean, that's yes. what at least I I do. And yes, yes, it's true. Yeah, sure, uh, no. Willie, paperwork. What is your yeah, I, what is your take in your school? So probably in terms of kitra paper kar kar aare aap. You know, that's yeah. that's a question which keeps coming. Sure. So I just want to know, uh, respond to paperwork as well as the question that came up before, um, because I just feel one of my points um, that I have in my mind is not represented. Um, uh, yes, you got to you got to give teachers the reason why you're collecting the data, right? And and uh, uh, sometimes uh, that might look manipulative. <laughs> if I were like, this is why I want it. Please do it. What we've really realized over time is that uh, you know, to truly respect the teacher's efforts, uh, we also have to share the results with them, right? Whatever data we get them to collect, we got to share the results with them. And that is something that we are very, very, uh, we do very well, right? Um, so one is we talk to the teachers on why, you know, what is the problem we're facing? Then we create a hypothesis with them. Then we build a data collection thing and then we build a data capture slash digitization system, like a system which allows the data 
to in most cases just come up automatically from children or from parents itself and our teachers are there to ensure that at the point of data capture the accuracy and quality of that data is high okay so that's something I will. and once that happens we try and use microsoft bi or any other uh, you know tools that do data visualization to create dynamic dashboards and then we share that data with teachers and we share the data with students and we share that data with parents now there are some some uh, aspects of data that uh, you know we don't we uh, we collect not to share but then in that case we don't use uh, you know our our internal teams for that yeah. kind of data so that's, that's yeah, otherwise they just think that they, they most of the time what i have felt is the teachers keep thinking about saying that okay we have been kind of uh, we are we are, they are, we are just being used by the school to just collect data but why are we done so one of the challenges which uh, one of the schools basically teachers basically mentioned with me is that uh, uh, we have something called as a year end uh, survey or satisfaction on the school work uh, on on our, our our own school per se as such so when you talk about the school as it as it is and what teachers are feeling and they don't get a, a presentation by the principal saying that we collected this particular data from you and this is the whole thing based on this these are the two policies that we have kind of worked upon it and i think that's something which is very very important uh, okay. uh, you know uh, to look at it but one of my challenge probably after working with multiple types of school is that we talk about what this word vocabulary which is called as personalization in education and the core of a school is that okay fine all the other data i'm okay with that but if you're not using the data to personalize the teaching learning practice or that learning for that particular child uh, why are we even collecting that kind of a data so i would like some concrete examples from uh, three of you that how how is that that's happening in your campus you think and anybody can start saying that uh, how particularly in the learning process the data is getting used and then trying to work on it because what i why i am asking this particular question is with new education policy talking so much about a 360 degree kind of a data and if a teacher doesn't have a data because uh, i would not like to you know comment on my own example but typically in most of the schools when you go for parent teacher meeting you get to hear ki okay your son is doing like this your daughter is doing like this and if they are performing well they are not performing well i think you just give them the whole thought but how exactly the child's data in terms of personalizing it and then taking it across anybody can start yeah. who are like to so i uh, doing my dissertation for my emit so uh, my topic was achievement in mathematics uh, using gamification okay so then uh, we taught we took a simple topic and it was taught to the children and uh, we decided to use two sections where the teacher was going the same teacher was going so in one class the conventional way of revision was done before taking assessment and the other class the teacher took the child to the computer lab to play a game the same topic was being taught using gamification so what we saw is that in this the children who perform well will have the same kind of performance when you go on the gamification side also but children who were having any some kind of learning problems learning issues or in fact there were some dyslexia children or some children who had learning disabilities now we saw that there was an improvement of 60% in their performance when they were using a gamified data and you realize that because that's because it's a non threatening environment that things are taking place perhaps it's just a game for the child and that's how the concepts are being revised so that's one place where i can see that you know data can help in helping uh, in getting personalization of the data also when you see the performance of the child you make your individualized child we have children who are who are special children so therefore the worksheets which are made the curriculum which is designed is completely different for those people as in comparison to the others once they come up to the particular mark then they are integrated back into the class so for all academic purposes the child is getting individualized attention and then for all sports and co curricular activities the child is back into the classroom so that's how we have tried to personalize data where uh, in our school is concerned for teaching learning process yes uh, uh, amita and billy anyone i think billy can say the rights give my comments so <laughs> 
So yeah, this is a, this is a big area of improvement for us because uh, the one thing that has always been perplexing me is uh, in the month of April, uh, our school starts. I mean, most uh, state board school starts in the month of June. So by um, by April, uh, annual calendar is ready, academic calendar is ready, timetable is ready, teacher is hired, everything. Right? Syllabus is kind of chopped up and neatly placed in a nice little sequence. How do you reteach? How do you uh, how do you personalize? Um, syllabus is already gone saying first term mein ye, ye chapter se ye questions you already I mean not you I mean we we've already done all that right now that itself is trying to say there's no personalization it's like me entering into a room and there's a placard on a table which says will you brought George yahan pe bethe. what personalization okay, right so we are actually we are actually back to the drawing board sitting down and trying to figure out how do we do real customization and personalization of education for that child. So we're actually now thinking, is there a way to change the timetable completely? Is there a way to change the way teachers are organized in the classrooms? Is there a way to change the way students are organized in the classrooms within the framework of the law so that we can create customization? The reason why children go for tuitions is because of customization, is because of personalization. And unfortunately, many schools, I don't know about others, but I mean, unfortunately, I don't think we're doing a great job at that. So we need to, this year is the year that we have we have decided is going to be the fulcrum change year, where we're going to dramatically change the way the school operates in a way whereby our policies, our, our, our methods, our frameworks, our strategies, everything is going to revolve around how we personalize instruction for children. Right, and most of the time when we talk about customization and personalization, we automatically assume that it is for children who are weaker than the kids who got it first time right. But the point, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, right, from my perspective, right. Uh, but what I'm also trying to say is that we want to customize learning for children so that you know um, everyone gets equitable instruction and everyone is able to receive that C plus one challenge and uh, and and do well. So that is an area of improvement for us that we're going to be working on. Sure, Amita. Uh, actually, when I said before, it's not important to have data, but it's also important to know what you do with your data. So uh, on the personalization front, I think individually, you know, personalization at the individual level is not possible. But yes, we have done something at the group level, especially, you know, in the higher classes, children who are identified using data over a period of time or three years time using data, children who have been identified as having the potential to solve higher order questions of a, I mean, where the question paper has largely higher order questions. They are dealt with separately in the sense that we, we, teach the same topic. So CBSC has one level, but for these children, we take the topic to the next level. That is one way we are doing it at higher classes. For the smaller classes, I think individually within the school time, again, is a very big challenge. But yes, we have tried to make groups and uh, you know uh, sets of teachers. One teacher deals with uh, those children in a separate way. So children weak in languages. Let's say children who have come, uh, nowadays you have RT kids in school, children who come from those environments who are normally found to be very weak in languages, that they are good at maths, but they're very weak in languages. So that languages part, we give them some extra input. You know, that is one way. And children who have problem with numbers, you know, dyscalculia, we identify them and give them some inputs, uh, extra inputs, give them some extra time. That is one. The third way that we have been also doing is to have separate sets of papers. See, um, my observation over a period of time is if you give the same question about every child, there are children who will solve it in a jiffy. There are children who will solve it using the full time and there will be kids who will not, not be able you. to solve the okay. full paper. So what we did as a team was to have three sets of papers, 
So each level has their own challenges. That is with respect to children. Now this is just when we talk of kids. But when you, but now the the major challenge is how do you uh, how do you bring down when you mark these papers? So how do you bring down? How do you convince a parent? You know the parent would say that usko to easy paper mila, mere bache ko difficult paper mila. Just because I my child is good doesn't mean he gets a difficult paper. Sure. So the challenge is how do you bring down that? How do you scale the marks to the same level? That is the challenge, and that is again a challenge with data. But I think uh, marks uh, are, I mean, they are just, I mean, to me they are just milestones. If you look at the learning outcomes, these uh, these things are very good over a period of time. Sure, the child have, gets a lot yeah. of things. Good. I, I think betting on what you all three of you said, I've got a. Amita, we are losing you. Sir, no, okay. you were speaking, sir. Okay. I'm done. Okay, fine. So, uh, Girish has asked a very interesting question. Please throw some light on what data enhances the academic performance other than subject average, school average, percentage, subject wise on the whole over a period of time at my school, irrespective of the age of the school. Now, anyone of you like to answer this particular question? Or I, I will surely answer this question, but I would love to hear from uh, other leaders basically saying that they talk about other than subject average, school average, percentage, subject wise, on whole, over a period of time is something uh, we really need to look for. Sir, no. I think these are these are things that are very commonly dealt with when you have the you know meeting after the board exam result when something <laughs> went down, this happened, that happened. Yeah, right. Okay, so okay. Instead, instead of that, I think uh, if, we, if, if schools learn to come out of this law of averages will be good, I think, and focus. But then having said that, it's, it's not very easy. The reason being, we also have a parental uh, side. So every, every school is proud putting that flex, you know, my average went up this year. So that's a challenge. But I think individually also, if you... Uh, at a lower level, if, if board exams were not there at a lower level, if you can identify kids who are good, who have abilities uh, in specific subjects, maybe we could think of something like, I have been trying something with respect to sciences. You are aware we have been trying to identify kids. We have been winning a lot of accolades. But then, yes, that is just one part. I mean, uh, we have been trying, but I am mean, not very sure how we can use data for that. So, uh... Dr. Senthil, yeah, go ahead. we have, you know, the absenteeism data, which uh, we utilized very effectively to convert our school from a six-day school to a five-day school. And it was a policy decision which was taken by the manager. You had uh, on Saturdays, in, especially in a city like Ludhiana, I do not know what is the culture, but Saturdays you hardly have your very thin attendance. If you okay. have all clubs, etc., organized on that, so perhaps be, is it because of that? But then we tried changing also. It does not really change much. So then um, we try to put up to the management that perhaps we need to convert our school into a five-day school to make sure our children perform better. And the, we do not lose on a day Saturday, which is happening. So we collected the data of children's presence in the three years. Right. We saw that, OK, this this particular class every across the school, there's a sharp drop in attendance on Saturdays. So then after Kedana doing a lot of calculations, we realized that on the first Saturday and the fifth Saturday, children will be coming. And on the other Saturdays, it will be off for the children. However, the school time got increased by half an hour. So the attendance data was a nice input for us. Also, the attendance data tells you a lot of things. Is the child facing some issues in the school due to which the child is being absent? And is it happening in the previous year also? Or is it happening only in this particular class? Is it happening only with one child? Or is it happening with a group of children? So you can make out what's what is the culture? What is the ethos of the system? What are the reasons due to which this is happening in a particular in our school? So I, we use even the absenteeism data in fact, uh, we have uh, data, you know, for teachers, when we do timetabling, 
lot of you and cry you like that one was your favorite so you gave these subjects to that person this one is your favorite therefore this class was given to her so we have a role based timetable which you know that we have implemented some years back so each one is the load is calculated of the teacher based on what kind of duties the teacher is performing and the chart is put up in the staff room so that there's a clarity that if somebody is having these classes this is the role now wait classes assignment is concerned you have the performance of the grades which comes to you we take a feedback from the students on both the implicit and explicit features of performance of the teacher so we try to see the performance as well as the you know the academic the review of the children or the feedback received from the children and then accordingly assign teachers so there's a scientific method if teacher comes to me and says that ma'am why am i not given class 10 well i have data with me to communicate that you know this is the reason why it's not been done so that's how we also utilize data yeah. anything quickly willi yeah. before i so, kind of take up uh, there are some yeah. questions quickly i'll read them so you can also see if you would like to address one of them uh, just preet kaur says that well said gogya ma'am helps teachers to work girish arbi says one of the ways to conduct a blame game free ptm is to share data on the areas of difficulty and improvement strategies for comparative uh, nina shori says okay data does help especially for all the planning in time to come priya says uh, that's the way the rich becomes <laughs> richer and poor stays poor madhu singh talks about personalized learning is possible only when smaller class size and ekta vaishnavi says the difference is as sir said it's challenging so these are some of the questions and comments which have come so really it's all so yeah great. very quickly one of those questions were around uh, you know uh, mean median mode and just student data in terms of assessment uh, obviously the person who asked that question is looking at trying to solve a problem around how do we how does he increase the learning levels in his classroom that's that yeah. that is essentially what i'm thinking about and he's also looking at data more in in, uh, in the terms of one particular student and that particular student's uh, uh, performance in a particular exam Uh, and that is that is his reference point i would recommend that he do two things one start thinking about causation versus correlation what is the what are the things that are causing certain behaviors and what are the things that uh, significant maybe you know not disconnected but uh, correlated to that i would also uh, recommend that you look at the entire um, uh, assessment data of that entire class which wrote one exam and plot it in a curve and see if it is forming a nice bell curve if it's forming a nice bell curve then you'll say you know gaussian curve you'll start realizing that the assessment that you've actually done is a really nice assessment that means that teacher understands where is that class and what is the level of complexity in that examination because teachers tend to teach to the middle right that is essentially what teachers do you teach to the middle you test the middle right so these are the two things that i would recommend that you do and then there are some really nice charts like the box and whiskers chart if you can create box and whiskers charts um uh, for your class wise assessment and then look at division a b c and d and see how does your box and whiskers charts change those are some data points that will give you some really interesting questions to ask sure but i think uh, what i personally believe if somebody who has been working with schools uh, willy as you said and others also said i think it's also depends upon what the school leadership is trying to look for one of the very important thing is that what is the dashboard which gets presented in the management committee meeting is something very very important first of all according to me you know because with my limited experience if the management is only asking the averages then we are only worried about averages okay we are not bothered about anything else okay saying ki okay this year i don't know how much control we have and uh, if everything goes on well with the way the new education policy is talking that we are going to move away from uh, summative to formative so you know summative to formative and uh, the you know semester based examinations are going to come i don't know what will be the kind of graphs which will be shown in the management committee meeting is going to become a big challenge that's point number one so the need okay the need as such uh, girish is i think uh, just to uh, you know supplement uh, and complement what my other three panelists have said one the one of the very important thing is the need of the school need of the people who are going to use that particular data if the need of the management is to see only the averages only the certain things then you will never be able to cut it the second important thing is that when i talk talking about the need i think for me if i am sitting as a management how much i have done impact through my practices 
how much impact I have done through my practices. In terms, I may write a very beautiful English vision statement, but if that English statement, beautiful vision statement is not getting converted into actual thought process, I think we're not going anywhere. So it's also equal. That's why I said, no, it's, it's purely starting from the management perspective. Uh, how exactly, what exactly management is trying to look for. But for me, if a child who's coming, the last kid in the classroom, the last kid in the school, uh, when we commit that particular child, the holistic development of that particular child, are we really even designing our practices towards it? So data collection is the second part of it, but what to collectively coming from what kind of practices that we are trying to look at it. Just for the benefit of people, but before we kind of, uh, you know, some of you are already more than an hour plus now, but then few things that what schools should look at it. Each one of you, can you just share two things what schools need to look at. Uh, there's a question also by Dipali on um, data maturity. We will surely take up some of those questions in my future episodes too. But my this particular time, as I'm running short of time, two two things that you should you suggest that uh, leadership teams in schools must look for or to do to make sure that they are more data driven campuses. Two things that they should do. Anybody can start. Yeah, so I would just say that make this a culture in your school where uh, whenever somebody gives you an idea, just ask the question, what makes you say that? How did you arrive at that uh, decision? Or how did you arrive at that influence? I think just asking that question immediately uh, depersonalizes. It's not about, uh, you know, it's not about the person. My experience or your experience. Yes. That's it. So what is the second one? First one is ask question. Okay. How did you yeah, arrive? So you're asking whether how did you arrive? Like what makes you say that? How okay. did you arrive at it? So those are those are like just getting that cultural nuance into into place. And also actually, you know, I think the second thing would be if you have any other supporting points or data, give that data and then ask that person, knowing what you know now, are you changing your position? Because then you start realizing that people start, you know, really being very nimble in their approach and that's what we want we want people who are flexible and nimble um, so that we can move and change the school in the in the direction in which we want it to go thank you willie because i think that was data literacy is something all about asking the right question and thank you to kick off with that um, amitav and uh, Ms. Gogia. anyone what are two things that you would like to say that okay this is how i, I would we say should that start building all, a culture for data in the campus yeah so first of all Start if you're collecting data, have a reason for it. Just don't collect data for the heck of collecting data and not utilizing it. So have a purpose and share the purpose with the stakeholder who's from whom you're collecting the data or whom you're asking to collect the data. That's very, very important. Take everybody on board before you start collecting data or you know, disseminating data. So second is if you're collecting data, make sure your decisions are made using the data. You may not be able to do 100% decision making based on data, but at least most of your practices should have the base as a data to be able to make your decisions. So these are my two takes. Sir. Amita. <laughs> Actually, uh, I think that um, first point is schools should collect all types of data. Even there should be a uh, there should be a uh, there should be a process to collect the maximum possible data. That is one in every field. So everything, every at every point of the school in every aspect of the school, whether it is academics, administration, admission, parent profiling, data should be there. That is the first thing. So every effort should be made to collect lots of data. Number two the school leadership team should decide on the, uh, they should decide the, the parameters for improving the school. What will be the, say next year, I want to improve on these three things in my school. So I want to improve on personalized learning. I want to improve on safety. I want to improve on, uh, on well-being of the children. So then use the data in, in, in that perspective to make your policies and try and predict, you know, try and show an improvement in those parameters. So if I say I want to have less sick children, then what measures should I take can be deduced using those data. 
if i say safety in the school needs improvement then using my transportation data and using my other data around the school building i should be able to make policies which will reduce safety which will increase safety of kids over a period of time so in that way you know management should think and data should be used sure yes really thank you amita for the point yes uh, you know i just want to say this one thing if we're going to be looking at schools collecting all kinds of data about children then i would only say start collecting all kinds of data as soon as you have a very strong data protection and privacy policy in place because you cannot be collecting all this data of children and then not having a very strong data collection and privacy policy in place so once that is in place then you know go ahead and and uh, collect whatever data you want i just felt like that is something that we didn't yeah yeah i think uh, today some somewhere i think uh, this protection policy per se data protection policy as such in one of the episodes surely we will talk about in future but uh, unanimously just trying to understand from each one of you just one line if do you think data literacy is must in indian schools do we really need them because uh, where are we and do we really need that to strengthen that what is your final comment from each one of you uh, it's a very if, important life skill you don't have a choice if the child has to survive in the world of tomorrow where everything is revolving around data data literacy is a must Fine. and we are in every school is doing it in some way or the other but we need to make you know focused attempt to make sure that the data literacy is being strengthened across the classes sure yes amita sir so 100% requirement of data literacy but it is also important that along with data literacy we also focus on how how to build on that literacy and what we do sure. so really? along with the protection and all this i fully agree to that sure. really i completely uh, agree to the fact that all our children and all our teachers and everybody needs to have a very data driven decision making approach because i think today children have so many options and so many different uh you know things that i throw on them and they need to find ways and methods and have strategies to take the right decisions and uh, we only hope that the decisions that they take are not based on the bad experiences that they have had they through. went through yeah very very so we got to i think uh, that that kind of brings it to the end of this particular session with only the refer reaffirmation the data literacy still there is a lot 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 to be done in our campuses per se such and we will surely uh go for a few more episodes on uh, understanding what's happening in the school even before trying to talk about uh, do we really need it or how are we going to go ahead and do it but uh, my uh, my only thing is that a uh, request to all the schools and participants who have seen i think you heard three passionate uh, school leaders uh, who basically shared that there is a need for it and we are moving into that kind of a era we are moving into that kind of a era that where we really need to kind of uh, make sure the appropriate data based on your need based on the purpose what you have created uh, one of the things which many people say that okay now a hindi hindi teacher or a english teacher also needs to know about data yes there is a need that all of us have to go through so it is not a math teachers or a computer teacher or a you know science teachers uh, work data it is every teacher who has to go through understanding appreciating the data all of us will surely agree with me that when it was a covid time during covid time no one told us what exactly to look for all of us looked at only one thing we bought that uh, oximeter and we had this particular data as soon as somebody said that okay i've got uh, covid the first answer which came up from the other side what is your score and the person said 80 and the person said 75 they said please go to the hospital so when life comes to some data points and then say that tomorrow morning you may not get up from the bed i think people may become serious about data but it's a journey that we really need to look at it with 358 assessments coming into the country with pisa kind of examinations coming into the country with the uh, you know cut kind of assessments coming into the country data will help the child to evolve to better we will surely talk about the child perspective but today is not a day for uh, child uh, discussion but uh, thank you very much this uh, is bhuvinder gogia mr amita thank Gokhi, you sir uh, yes, really for joining us for this particular sunday evening and this yatra will continue where we will surely go back and 
work on uh, digital literacy. There are a few questions which have not been answered. I assure you on data maturity and other things, surely we will be able to get into one of our future episodes. Thank you very much. Stay Thank safe. You. All the best Thank to you, your, sir. for writing examinations across. Thank you.